I covered Will Porter's trial for the uh, Austin Daily Statesman on February 15th, 1898. I've held up pretty well since then. I hope you can agree. Of course, uh, most folks didn't pay much attention to it uh, back in 1898 because on the same day, the battleship Maine blew up in Havana Harbor and the United States started getting ready to uh, go to war. Sounds sort of familiar. Of course, we haven't anything blow up yet, and uh, we haven't. President McKinley was not under any sort of investigation by an independent uh, prosecutor. Of course, Austin, as you know, back in 1898 was not a very big town. I knew Will long before he went on trial for embezzlement the first time. Matter of fact, Will and I occasionally would uh, have a drink together over at the uh, Bismarck uh, uh, Saloon. Uh, you know, reporters got to keep up their sources, and, and uh, we never had more than a couple of beers uh, at any time at all. But uh, uh, <clears throat> before we get started today, let me sort of give you the scoop on old Will, tell you a little bit about him, and a little bit about what we're up to today. Will came to Texas in uh, 1888 from North Carolina on account of his health. A lot of people came to Texas on account of their health, but he, uh, he really did. He had a bad problem uh, with his lungs. He was 19 years old. He went to a ranch down in South Texas in LaSalle County, managed by Lee Hall, who was a former Texas Ranger. In 1884, he moved to Austin. He worked uh, for a short time at a variety of things. He worked at a cigar store. He and I both share an affinity for cigars. Uh, he uh, worked at a drug store. He was a registered pharmacist from his background in North Carolina, and he dabbled in real estate. In 1887, he married one of the prettiest belles of Austin, Ethel Estes. When Hall's brother Dick got himself elected to the uh, land office, uh, surprise, uh, Will got a job as a draftsman at the land office. I think, can you say political patronage? Uh, meanwhile, in 1889, Will and Ethel had a daughter, Margaret. Shortly after he left the state payroll in 1891, Will was hired as a teller at the First National Bank here in Austin. They paid him $100 a month, which is the same thing he was getting at the general land office. Now, adjusted slightly for inflation, that's about what state employees still get. <laughs> Will, of course, uh, had his day job there at the bank, but he was a, a creative sort. He, uh, he was very much uh, in favor of and a protect practitioner of puns and poetry and funny drawings, and uh, he liked to tell stories. In 1894, when he was still on the bank's payroll, he entered another enterprise that's pretty famous for its low pay, the newspaper business. He began publishing the Rolling Stone, which uh, gathered no moss and very little money. Now, the rest of the story pretty much ought to come out in the testimony that you're going to hear today. I want to say this, whatever verdict the jury reaches today, we understand that history cannot be undone. In real life, Will was convicted of a federal crime, and he was sentenced to five years in federal prison. He served 39 months of that sentence at the state penitentiary in Columbus, Ohio. Now, you know, for a writer, it was actually pretty good news. His prison time uh, gave him some time to uh, do what he always wanted to do, which was to write. Uh, he started writing short stories there using the, pardon the expression, pen name of O. Henry. But of course, like a clock, you know, we're going to take uh, Will's story apart today and, and see what makes it tick. So because of that, uh, what you're about to see today is sort of analogous to those of you who remember live TV from the 1950s and 1960s. This is a semi-unrehearsed live broadcast today, so you'll pardon any little slight lapses that uh, may occur. Now, we have, to compress time, we have made some composite witnesses. We're not going to try to bring up every witness that appeared at the, at the first trial, and we will be taking a few chronological uh, liberties in the interest of getting some information across. Like we say in the newspaper business, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. So uh, we're going to do that today. But I want you to know that the verdict of the jury has not been scripted. I mean, this, this is for real. Uh, a jury of 12 people will, again, decide uh, today whether they believe uh, Will Porter was innocent or guilty. U.S. District Court for the Western District of Texas is now in session. 
Honorable Judge Jack Hightower now presiding. God save the United States in this honorable court. Be seated. Madam Prosecutor, is the government ready? The United States of America is ready, Your Honor. Mr. Defense Attorney, is the defense ready? The defendant, Will Porter, is ready, Your Honor. All right. Um, uh, then we'll proceed. Um, Madam Prosecutor, do you have an opening statement? May I proceed, Your Honor? May it please the court. May it please the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. My name is Jan Patterson, and it is my honor to represent the United States of America in this proceeding today. Over 10 years ago, a young man came to our fair city, Austin, Texas, from North Carolina. He was a young, eligible bachelor. The story you will hear today is how those years left their mark on the young man and brought him here today before you in disgrace. You will hear proof of that man's journey from Austin to North Carolina and from joy and love to sorrow and humiliation. The defendant before you today is Will Porter, sitting right here, and his crime is that of embezzlement. He stole from the bank that employed him. Now the evidence is clear that he took money from customers of the bank and failed to credit their accounts. No one will be able to tell you exactly what he did with the money, but we have some suspicions about that. You will hear evidence about his motives. Now you will hear about the, how the high life of Austin seduced the defendant. Like many of our young men, often uh, who traveled with Will Porter, uh, Mr. Porter spent money, often not his own money, on gambling, booze, and women. Even after he married, they played Pharaoh, Chuckaluck, Kino, stud poker, and roulette at places such as Ben Marshall's at, or Bill Perkins, often late into the night. And they drank and they ate on credit and money that was not theirs. And Will Porter incurred large debts. They danced at Turner Hall until their collars wilted. <laughs> now, Will Porter married, but he continued to borrow from his friends and he continued to borrow from his father-in-law. And you will hear evidence about how they gave him that money and about how he lived a life of debt. You will also hear about how Will Porter drifted from job to job. He started off in North Carolina as a pharmacist. He became a bookkeeper, a draftsman, a newspaper writer, and a bank teller. And during this time, he found no job to which he was suited. Most of all, Will Porter was no banker. As a teller, he had entered upon a career that he was not suited to, that he had neither the skills nor the temperament. He had to receive deposits, cash checks and drafts, and keep books on the side. Now, how do we know that Will Porter is guilty? First of all, we will hear evidence from the, book, from the bank examiner who discovered over 50 instances of missing funds. Second, we know that Will Porter quit his job a month after the irregularities were discovered. Third, you will hear that Will Porter himself acknowledged the theft. He offered to borrow more money from his father-in-law to pay back those debts. And finally, when indicted, what did Will Porter do? He did not show up for trial. He fled to Honduras. Now, we all know that a guilty man will stand up and speak his innocence, but this man, Will Porter, fled to Honduras where there is no extradition treaty. Now, if you listen and observe these witnesses carefully and examine the motives that they might have to testify, the government is confident that you will find this defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I do, Your Honor. May it please the court. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I am pleased to stand here for my friend, Will Porter, who is so wrongfully accused by the government 
by an overzealous bank examiner who is out to make an example of a Texas bank for all the banks in this great state of ours, even if it means ruining the life of an innocent man. Now, some of you know Will because he's lived among us in our community for most of the last 14 years. You customers of the First National Bank will recall Will as that friendly teller. And many of us have enjoyed his columns, his drawings and political cartoons in his weekly newspaper, The Rolling Stone. And now more recently, for those of you who subscribe to or have occasion to pick up and see a copy of the Houston Post, he's now a widely, a widely read and nationally promising columnist and political cartoonist for that Houston newspaper. He married into the Pete and Mary Jane Roach family, what a little over 10 years ago, he wed their daughter, Athel, in the West 6th Street home of Dr. Richmond Kelly Smoot, their pastor at the First Southern Presbyterian Church. And now, a little over six months ago, he lost his beloved Athel after her lengthy bout with tuberculosis. He is left with raising his young eight-year-old daughter, Margaret, and he is standing here so wrongfully accused by this federal government and this federal bank examiner. We have enjoyed Will's humor, his drawings, his music, both in the church choirs of the First Southern Presbyterian Church and in St. David's Episcopal Church and in productions at the Malay Opera House and other venues about town. He has made our lives here in Austin a little better. While Will may have enjoyed a good time with his friends and may have been a lot of things to a lot of people, no one will say he is dishonest. Now he stands before you accused of this zealous bank examiner for, of embezzling money from a bank he hasn't even worked for in over three years. A bank we all know as having very loose banking practices but as we all know, not one depositor has ever lost a penny in that bank. The evidence in this case will show we believe, one, that the reason Will is on trial is because he was the only bank officer at the bank that was bonded. That means simply that the bank had a piece of paper from an insurance company saying they would pay the bank money if the bank could ever prove that the bonded employee took any of the bank's money. Two that this federal bank examiner was out to make an example of this bank for all other banks in Texas, and Will just happened to be the most handy scapegoat to blame for all these questionable banking practices. One, because he was bonded, and that he was bonded because he happened to serve in the position of being a teller. He's the scapegoat because he wasn't well-to-do. He wasn't a big civic leader like the Breckenridge brothers. You know the hospital down here is named after him or Mr. Hamilton, the vice president of the bank. He's here as a scapegoat, because, most of all, because he hasn't even been in town in these last, well, he has been in town for this last year, but while all this stuff was going on, he was working in Houston for the Houston Post to try and support his family. What an easier target, and I say shame on the government. Most telling, we believe that the evidence will show these questionable bank banking laxities didn't stop when Will left the employment of the bank, but continued after he was gone. Yet Will is on trial here, not Tom Brackenridge, not Bob Brackenridge, not Frank Hamilton, the president, the cashier, and the vice president, all of his superiors at the bank. While you listen to the evidence that comes from the witness stands and the exhibits that the court admits into evidence, listen to the distinction of being, quote, responsible for the money of the bank because of an employment position at the bank as opposed to taking money and converting it to one's own use. The prosecutor today told you she couldn't even tell you, no one was going to tell you, that Will used the money for his own use. Oh, she speculates, but we submit to you there'll be no evidence that Will converted any money to his own use. Now, we're not going to deny that Will was a teller. Ever, most of you all know that. Uh, but just because he might have been in that position doesn't mean that he committed the crime of embezzlement. 
To embezzle money means he has to have actual and lawful possession or custody of the property of another by virtue of some trust, duty, agency, or employment committed to the party charged, and while so lawfully and in the possession and custody of such property, the person must unlawfully and wrongfully convert the same to his own use. Listen to hear if you listen to see if you hear any evidence that he did that. Finally, the prosecutor may try to make some big deal from testimony about Will being in the Honduras for several months, claiming that as she just you just heard her do, claiming that flight somehow employs guilt. But also listen to the evidence that we believe will show that Will has voluntarily come back to Austin to stand trial here today, that he has been in Austin for over the last year awaiting trial. He has not been in jail. If he wanted to flee, he could have. Ask yourself, as you listen to the prosecutor's evidence, what does that imply? He walked into the courtroom today of his own free will. After you hear the evidence, we believe you should, will find that he should walk out of this courtroom today of his own free will. Madam Prosecutor? At this time, the government calls Tom Brackenridge. Mr. Brackenridge, you were sworn earlier. Yes. Be seated. Would you state your full name for the jury? Yes, I am Tom Brackenridge, former president of the First National Bank. And would you tell the ladies and gentlemen a little bit about yourself? Well, as you know, I'm retired these days, uh, living on my farm in South Austin, and I raise Jersey bulls, prize bulls, and also some bronze turkeys. I do uh, volunteer my time in the, uh, with the Confederate home, and I uh, spend a lot of time uh, volunteering uh, around the community, dabbling in local politics and things like that, yes. And did you actually serve the Confederacy, sir? Uh, yes, I was a colonel in the Confederate Army. And was the First National Bank family owned? Yes, the uh, First National Bank was uh, purchased uh, in, in 1891 by my brothers uh, Bob and George and I. And tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how you ran your bank. We uh, worked together, and uh, of course, uh, Bob was the real businessman of the bank. He had owned the bank in San Antonio for quite some years. And uh, often, uh, if someone needed to borrow some money from the bank, they would come to the bank and we offer them a credit slip and then uh, write that credit slip down that day or possibly the next day and, and lend the money. That was a frequent practice of the bank. And were those standard practices of the day? Oh, yes, yeah, standard practices in all banks of Texas. And did you run your bank in a good and correct manner, Mr. Breckenridge? Oh, yes, we think so. And did, did there come a time when you met the defendant, Will Porter? Yes, uh, Will came to work uh, for the bank in, in 91. Do you see Will Porter in the courtroom today? Yes, he's this gentleman right here on the right. Okay. Could you describe him for the jury? He's this gentleman sitting at the defense table with uh, the bearded man there, uh, leaning back in his chair with the, um, the coat and vest on. And how did Mr. Porter come to be employed by you, sir? Well, Mr. Uh, Porter, uh, came to our bank and uh, needed a job as, the, uh, as a clerk. And he had held several different positions, several different jobs uh, throughout Austin, and uh, we decided to give him a try. He seemed a nice enough young man. And did there come a time when you learned that Mr. Porter had some financial difficulties? Well, yes. Uh, in, uh, I believe it was 93, Mr. Porter started uh, a newspaper called The Rolling Stone. And uh, although it was a literary success uh, in the uh, ongoing, it, it came to be quite a financial burden for him, I believe. And uh, I know that he did uh, spend a lot of money uh, publishing that paper. Uh, also, uh, Will was uh, prone to the, uh, the high life around here at Austin's. Uh, I'd seen him on occasion at uh, Schultz's garden. Objection, He'd... Your Honor. Objection sustained. And what did you learn about his lifestyle? Well, I learned uh, that uh, Mr. Porter did enjoy uh, the drink a bit, and he did like to gamble and play cards. And uh, he was, uh, I would say, a ladies' man, if you will. And did this continue even after he married? 
Well, uh, not. He was not a ladies' man after he married. I don't believe that. But uh, he did like to, uh, he did still enjoy gambling, yes, and drinking and eating at some of our finer restaurants. And here. generally the high life, sir, yes. is that right? Now, did there come a time when you left the bank? Well, I, I did sell the bank in 93 uh, to a gentleman by the name of Frank Hamilton and R.J. Johnson. And uh, they were from uh, the Jonathan and Raymond Company. It was a private banking house, yes. And did you, were there any particular problems that you had with the bank, Mr. Brackenridge? At the time that uh, it was sold? Yes, sir. No, I had just decided at that time that my interests lie elsewhere. I wanted to devote more time to community and uh, the volunteer, uh, volunteering that I was doing it came to be a priority for me, yes. And you stayed on with the bank, did you not? Well, I was a minority stockholder, only owned 10 shares out of the 1,000 shares of the bank. And uh, I stayed on as president for a short time. Yes, I did, until uh, Mr. Johnson replaced me. And did the bank have some problems at that time? Yes, after I had uh, resigned as president, uh, there were a few problems with the bank. And what were those problems, sir? Well, let's see. Uh, in December 95, uh, Mr. Hamilton did resign from the bank, and uh, he had to pay off some $6,000 of overdrafts that he had written on the bank. And this Mr. Hamilton, did, did he pay back the money? Uh, yes, he did. He. Uh, he paid back uh, all but $3,000 of it, and uh, at that time, um, yes, at that time, the, uh, the uh, bank examiner, Mr. Gray, who's sitting here, uh, had, had come down and uh, ordered an investigation, and, and at that time, um, uh, Mr. Hamilton went to Mr. Porter and told him that... Uh, all right, Jack. The question was, did he pay back the money, and the witness answered that he didn't pay back $3,000 of it. Now he's going on beyond... The witness will respond to the question. Oh, uh, yes, Your Honor. Well, that raises the next question. Did you also have some problems with Mr. Porter that were uncovered at that time? Uh, well, yes, we know that uh, that uh, Mr. Hamilton went to Mr. Porter and told him that uh, he expected him to share in the responsibility of the $3,000, that uh, he was the teller after all. And Mr. Porter agreed and went to, uh, uh, to borrow some $1,500 to repay uh, the bank. And was there also an incident with Mr. Porter involving a customer of the bank named Gwaltney? Yes, there were two incidents uh, that, um, that were involved in this uh, second indictment uh, of Mr. Porter. And uh, the first instance was of Mr. Wartney. He uh, put down some $550 for a draft on a San Antonio bank uh, from Porter. And then uh, two days later, the bank in San Antonio, uh, they paid the draft, but at the end of the month, they, they complained that the First National in Austin had never made the payment. And uh, at the trial, of the audit testified that uh, the San Antonio Bank, uh, until they complained about it, uh, there was no record of the transaction, and the error was corrected by, by my brother, Bob. And that was Mr. Porter's responsibility, was yes, it Yes, it was. It was Mr. Porter's responsibility as teller of the bank. Was there another episode involving a credit slip? Yes, there was. Uh, four days later, there was a credit slip that was sent by Porter, uh, in, in his handwriting to a bank in Waco. At the end of the month, uh, the Waco bank complained that they had not been credited with, uh, I believe it was uh, $299.60, although they had uh, the Porter's credit slip and uh, the signed letter. Uh, again, Bob intervened and, and wrote the bank in Waco and made good on the slip. And was that credit slip in Porter's handwriting? Yes, it was. Uh, some uh, uh, people at the bank uh, had testified that uh, the handwriting was of uh, Will Porter's. And had he failed to follow the proper procedure, Mr. Brackenridge? Yes, uh, our procedure at the bank is usually to post the entry in the bank books uh, that day for any credit slips, or at least uh, the following day. Sometimes that happens, uh, we forget and do it the next day. But on this occasion, it was never posted at all. Now, defense counsel has made much of the fact that none of the customers ever lost money. Isn't that because you made good on Mr. Porter's thefts, Mr. Brackenridge? Well, that's correct. Every time that uh, there was some kind of credit slipped issued and an error made, uh, and I believe there was some um, 
you know, 50 odd times that that indeed did happen, uh, the bank always made good on those, yes. So no customer ever lost money? No, no one ever lost any money. Now, apart from Mr. Hamilton's indiscretions and Mr. Porter's thefts, was the bank generally well run? Council will refrain from comments on the way to the evidence. Apart from the incidents involving Mr. Porter and the incidents involving Mr. Hamilton, was the bank generally well run? Yes, I would say it would be. I have no further questions. You have redirect to uh, counsel. I do, Your Honor. I'm kind of confused as to what to call you. You said you were a colonel in the Confederate, uh, Confederate Army? That's correct. But your name is Major Tom Brackenridge? That's correct. Demoted, huh? Well, uh, you see what happened in the war, don't you? <laughs> no, Major Brackenridge, I don't. Now let's go back and talk about some of this testimony that you've just given. Bob Brackenridge, who you've spoken so highly of, who's he? He's my brother. Yes, sir, he is. And you've had other family members that have worked in that bank, haven't you? That's correct. In fact, your nephew, Mr. Uh, J.N. Thornton, worked I'm, in that, that bank. That's Bob's nephew. That's not my nephew. Thank you. If it's Bob's nephew and you and Bob are brothers, isn't it your nephew, too? No, it was not. It was a nephew uh, on his... Uh, on his wife's side? That's oh, correct. I stand corrected. Thank you. You talked about two instances and two instances only. One of Mr. Gwartner, was that his name? Yes, it was. And another one involving the bank in Waco? Yes. Now, no one has ever said, and you know of no instance, where Will Porter ever took any of the bank's money for his own use. Isn't that correct, Major Brackenridge? Only two of the indictments uh, were brought to trial. Those are the only indictments, Major Brackenridge, that this jury is interested in today. Now, there have been no instances that you know of, and you've not heard of any instance, where Will Porter ever took any bank's money for his own use. Isn't that correct? That's correct, not specifically. Yes, sir. And Will, of course, took lunches off at the bank, didn't he? Yes, he did. And that cash drawer was open. Isn't that correct? That's correct. During those times when he was home eating lunch with his wife, that cash drawer was open for anybody to come, take money out of it, maybe leave some sort of note, say I took some money, maybe not, isn't that right? Well, it may have been open, but I do not believe that any of the other uh, tellers or cashiers would take money from Mr. Uh, Mr. Will's uh, draw. Maybe not another teller, but we've already you've talked about uh, Mr. Hamilton owed a substantial sum of money that, that finally he p had to pay off some, but he, he didn't end up paying $3,000 of it. Isn't that correct? Well, it was a common practice among the banks at that time to uh, withdraw money for oneself or, or some rancher in the area that needed to pay uh, their hands and then credit that slip later. And just reach in, take the money, either for yourself or another bank officer's uh, purposes or uh, for the purpose of a bank customer, correct? It's, it could have happened, but it was always re repaid or accounted for the, that day or the following day. Well, you said it always was, but in truth, Major Breckenridge, that's not the case, is it? There are, that may have been what s was supposed to have taken place, but that's not what actually took place, correct? Well, there, there was that one occasion with uh, Bob's nephew, yes. Yes. In, in <laughs> fact, that's when J.M. Thornton was accused of embezzling, maybe you might call it borrowing money from the bank that he didn't pay back. And there's an instance where the bank reached in and had to make good your, Bob's nephew, your brother's nephew's uh, indiscretions, his embezzlements, correct? That's correct. Uh, we did uh, remove him from his job at that time. You didn't prosecute him, did you? Well, we didn't see the, the good that that would do to the, the young boy. Didn't have any money? He wasn't bonded, was he? No, he was not. Uh, now, you said you retired from the bank so that you could enjoy your charitable activities. I think that's about what you said. But isn't a fact, sir, that the bank examiners were forcing you to change the management of the bank because the bank examiners uh, regarded 
your management and that of your brothers as being incompetent and inefficient? No, sir. Governor objects. This man is not on trial Objection here today. Uh, no, sir. In fact, uh, could you repeat that question, please? Uh, yes. It, and the bank examiners, the federal bank examiners that are today prosecuting uh, Will Porter here, uh, haven't they considered you to be uh, incompetent and inefficient? No, that is not true. I, as I said earlier, I was a minority stockholder in the bank at that time. After you were forced out as president, correct? No, that's not, uh, that's not uh, correct. After I sold the bank, I became a minority stockholder, and that was before Mr. Gray came down to examine the bank, you see. I see, but the bank examiners did come down, and the bank examiners did strongly encouraged, did require as a condition, a change of management. Isn't that right? The, the uh, change in management had already been made before they came down. And that was Mr. Frank Hamilton? Yes. And Mr. Frank Hamilton uh, became a vice president? That's correct. And Mr. Frank Hamilton happened to kind of take money from the till for his own use too, didn't he? That's correct. Now, you would agree with me that the bank used questionable bookkeeping practices, uh, that it would be hard to determine just from looking at the books what was happening at the bank at any given time? No, I, I wouldn't agree with that, sir. Well, sir, you talked about taking money out of the bank, uh, the cash, out of the cash drawer there, and supposedly somebody was supposed to write a credit, but if that occurred when Will was at lunch, and he came back and somebody forgot to, let's give them the benefit of the doubt and say they forgot to, there'd be no way for Will to know that a credit uh, memo needed to be written. Isn't that correct? That's possible, sir. Yes, sir, it is possible. I pass the witness. Now, Mr. Brackenridge, you don't know of any instance where someone did not put in a credit slip, do you? No, I know of no instance. And do you know of any instance where Mr. Porter complained to you about money being missing from his drawer and being taken by someone else? Well, I did on occasion uh, recall that uh, Mr. Porter did complain of that, yes. And was the money then replaced? It was replaced. And did Mr. Porter ever complain to you about practices or how the bank was run? Uh, well, he often mentioned that uh, he thought it was irregular for us to uh, you know, operate our, our business in this way with credit slips and repaying the loans the following day. But uh, I assured him that it was common practice amongst all the banks here in Texas. Thank you, Mr. Brackenridge. Mr. Right, Bracken that, uh, excuse me, Your Honor, I have one. You have one more question. I do. Or one, one question. Major no, Brackenridge. Will was your employee, and he needed that banking job to support his family, didn't he? That's correct. No further questions. All right. Uh, you're excused, uh, Mr. Brackenridge, Major Brackenridge. Thank you very much. Counsel, call your next witness. We call Mr. Gray to the stand, Your Honor. State your name for the, for the jury, please. My name is uh, Franklin, Be seated. Be seated. Franklin Burns Gray. I'm the federal bank examiner out of Washington, D.C. And what is a bank examiner, Mr. Gray, and how long have you been so employed? Uh, I've been in various jobs in the banking business for uh, uh, a number of years, uh, approximately 15 years, ma'am. Uh, I've, uh, I've been in the, in the employ of the United States government uh, now for uh, the, the past uh, four and a half years. Can you tell us a little bit about the banking conditions in the United States today? Well, as you know, uh, after, the, uh, after the great uh, conflict, uh, the, uh, Civil War, I believe they're calling it now. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, you're speaking of the war. The war between, between the, the states. states. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> the, uh, the country was, uh, was eager to rebuild, uh, and, uh, and the, um, the president, uh, President McKinley, uh, has, uh, has issued a, a, a mandate to, uh, to the federal bank examiners to, uh, to, to travel to these, uh, to these out of the way places such as Texas. And, uh, uh, to, to, uh, to see that the banking practices are brought into line with, the, with what is common practice uh, back east. And how did you come to the First National Bank of Austin, Texas? Um, I, was, uh, I was sent here uh, to follow up on some work that was done by my predecessor, J.J. Uh, Gannon, who had uh, made the initial visits here to, uh, to Austin um, back in, um, I believe it was 94. Uh, uh, and what did you and Mr. Gannon discover when you came to the First National Bank? Well, I, I uh, 
he had he had made several visits to the to the bank and uh, and uh, uh, on on his first trip uh, he felt he felt that uh, after meeting the Brackenridge brothers that uh, that they were highly highly unsuited to uh, to the banking business they had been they'd both been set up in the in the bank here in Austin uh, uh, by their uh, brother in San Antonio who was a, a prosperous well uh, well liked banker there in San Antonio uh, George Brackenridge. And um, yet uh, the, the brothers here in Austin, uh, uh, Tom and, and Bob Breckenridge, uh, primarily are, uh, are from the, the, the ranching industry uh, and uh, the agrarian lifestyle, not well suited to, to banking, not, uh, not any background in banking. And, um, and yet they had been uh, given charge of this, of this uh, uh, first national uh, bank in, uh, in Austin here and um, had uh, uh, set about uh, playing at banking. Uh, and um, it uh, it it was um, not well suited to them, and uh, and their their practices left much to be desired. I assure you, uh, they um, they s seldom held uh, board meetings. Uh, uh, there uh, there was um, one of the one of the first reports that Mr. Gannon gave, if I may uh, look here. Um, Are you referring to your? Notes, I'm referring sir? to my notes, sir. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, the uh, Mr. Mr. Gannon's report uh, said that um, that it is, is beyond me why the Breckenridge brothers continue to be in charge uh, of the bank. He says uh, the, the best thing that he can say about their business is that they are in a handsome building at a convenient location. <laughs> well, and did you discuss these practices with the Breckenridge brothers and try to correct them work and work with them? I did. Uh, I did investigate uh, along with uh, with Mr. Gannon, with whom I compared a number of notes. Uh, I did investigate uh, uh, a number of these instances, uh, and uh, and particularly uh, 50 separate instances that um, uh, where wherein uh, money money was missing or unaccounted for, uh, and uh, and there uh, uh, there was there's no proper paperwork at all. Uh, uh, done on this, and, I, and it, uh, it was very distressing to me because I come from a, from a background where we, we thrive on paperwork, and uh, <laughs> and I I uh, I uh, was just most most distressed to see the uh, the the shoddy way that uh, that the banking practices were being taken uh, uh, here. It's 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 very difficult to get anyone to take banking seriously in in this uh, state. And and do you recall an incident involving Mr. Hamilton? Uh, Mr. Hamilton, the uh, uh, the the new vice president uh, uh, that, that came came on uh, after the bank was uh, was sold to the Raymond Company. Um, yes, Mr. Hamilton uh, was uh, was responsible, as the uh, previous witness mentioned, uh, was responsible for the uh, for the six thousand uh, dollars that was um, undocumented. Uh, and and uh, did stand good for it. Uh, many of these many of these informal uh, loans or, or uh, extensions were uh, formalized after the after the transfer to the Raymond Company. These these were formalized into into loans, uh, and and all of this all of the shortages were made up at that time. Now, why did you hold Will Porter responsible for the irregularities, particularly the two before us today, but the fifty irregularities? Your Honor, I object to that question. Uh, the only thing that this jury is, is asked to consider are uh, two instances under three well, counts. The I'll confine it. will be overruled. You may proceed with your case, counsel. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Gray. The question? Would you tell us why you held Will Porter responsible for these irregularities? Well, it was it was the opinion of uh, of the uh, Breckenridge brothers that uh, that Mr. Porter having uh, having yeah, virtually I, I object. That's definitely hearsay when he says the opinion counsel, of someone else. Counsel, would you please keep your seat? That this jury is entitled to hear what happened. I am your honor. May and, I have a and ruling? This prosecutor is asked a question about what happened, and so that's what we want this jury to hear. So uh, I will. Consider your objections when they're proper. Please be seated. Your Honor, may I have a ruling on my objection? Uh, at the proper time, counsel. I'd your, like a your ruling. Objection is noticed. Your objection is noticed. Shall I proceed? <laughs> it, it was conveyed to me by, by uh, the Breckenridge brothers that uh, they, um, they were suspicious of some of the transactions uh, done uh, under the under the uh, watch of Mr. Porter, uh, Mr. Porter 
had no background in banking. He, he had, was trained as a pharmacist, uh, was well liked in the community uh, socially, uh, yet, yet uh, came to the bank with, with virtually um, no, no background or training uh, to be a teller. It is, it is um, quite probable that this is the reason why he was bonded. Uh, m many of the other officers of the bank uh, and employees of the bank were members of the Breckenridge family or, or uh, good friends of the Breckenridge family. Mr. Porter, however, was not. Uh, and, and it is not uncommon for uh, a, a bonding to be made by a surety company in this case uh, if there's any, any possibility that, uh, that an employee might abscond with funds or, or might, uh, might need to be insured. Uh, Mr. Porter was the only bonded employee of the bank. And I think uh, it is not without are you, are you good saying, reason. You're saying now that, that the bank didn't consider it important for the members of the family to be bonded because they were going to have to pay for it anyway? Is that what you're telling me, the, the court jury? The, Bra the Brackenridge brothers are upstanding members of the community, quite well-to-do, and quite able to cover their losses, as was, as was shown in previous testimony. Uh, Mr. Porter, however, is not a man of means and, and would not have been able to cover uh, any of any of these uh, losses or discrepancies had it not been for his father-in-law. And who was the person who had ultimate responsibility for the funds in the drawer, Mr. Gray? Well, it's always the ultimate responsibility of the, of the teller on duty uh, to, to balance his books at the end of the day and to make things come out correctly. Uh, and it, that was Mr. Porter, was it that not? That was Mr. Porter. And isn't it a fact that Mr. Porter actually acknowledged to you that he stole the money? Uh, Didn't he agree not, to pay it back? Not in so many words, but uh, the, uh, uh, Frank Hamilton, the, uh, the uh, current vice president of the bank, and uh, Mr. Carr Lucy, uh, who is uh, a representative of the American Surety Company, which bonded Porter, uh, met with uh, Mr. Porter and his father-in-law, um, P.G. Roach, uh, and, and this was after Mr. Porter no longer worked at the bank. They brought to him the, the evidence of, of this missing funds, and, uh, and it was made very clear to him that uh, since he was responsible for the, the money in the drawer on, these, on the dates of these transactions, that he would be held liable for this money. And, and he did agree to pay $1,500 of the, of the uh, $3,000 that Mr. Hamilton uh, did not pay. And how can you be so, so sure that Mr. Porter is responsible for the missing funds? Uh, I, th I think it is, it is uh, without a doubt a very firm, uh, very firm evidence that Mr. Uh, Porter felt a responsibility for these funds as evidenced by the fact that he was able, able to talk his father-in-law into uh, putting up the money for him. And further, Mr. Gray, what did he do when the irregularities were uncovered? Did the, he stay at the bank? Uh, he was no longer in the, in the employ of the bank. <laughs> Isn't it a uh, fact that he resigned from the bank 30 he, days after the, uh, about a month after the irregularities were uncovered? Leading, Your Honor. Just refreshing the witness's recollection, Your Honor. The, the the, uh, to the best of my recollection, I, I believe he had resigned the bank earlier. Okay. And what did he do when he learned about the indictment? Did he show up for trial, or, or where did he go? Um, well, it was a it was a an, an unfortunate set of circumstances that uh, that led to the indictment. Uh, the original indictment uh, was. Uh, uh, in the original indictment, uh, Porter was no billed. Uh, the uh, the grand jury was was not able to indict him, and it was uh, largely due to the incompetence of the uh, of the district attorney in San Antonio. Uh, uh, and I, I was most distressed uh, that Mr. Uh, Mr. Cul uh, Culbertson, I believe it was, uh, he he had such lack of zeal in calling the case, he even failed to serve the subpoenas. Well, was it also no billed because of people on the grand jury on the grand jury who was on that grand jury? Ob objection, leading the objection on. is sustained. Isn't it a fact that Mr. Thornton was on that grand jury? Uh, yes, Mr. Thornton, the, nep the nephew of, uh, of uh, Bob Breckenridge, was the, uh, the foreman of that grand jury. 
And there was a time when he was indicted again, is that right, by the next grand jury? Yes, eventually, eventually the next grand jury uh, was able to indict him, and, and uh, uh, they did indict him for the, uh, originally for the, for the uh, 50 different occasions on a sum totaling $5,654.20. And did he show up for trial, Mr. Gray? Uh, he was working in uh, Houston at the, at the uh, Houston Post at the time and was um, uh, uh, informed that he would have to return to Austin to, to uh, stand trial for that. Uh, Your Honor, I object to non-responsiveness of the answer. The question is, did he show up at trial? The witness has gone no, on. The witness will, will respond to the question as asked. Mr. Porter left Houston with the intention of, sh of coming to Austin to stand trial. It was the impression that he gave the people in Houston and it was the impression of the people in Austin that he was returning to Austin. He did not, however, he did not show up. Where did he go? Uh, I believe evidence has shown that he did spend approximately six months in uh, Honduras. Okay. Isn't it a fact, Mr. Gray, that Mr. Porter fled to Honduras to avoid trial? It is a fact that Mr. Porter fled to Honduras. It is very, sus very suspicious that Honduras does not have extradition uh, arrangement with the United States of America. And isn't it a fact, Mr. Gray, that a guilty man runs from the law, an innocent man stays to be tried and detained? Your objection is I have no you, further God. questions, Your Honor. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Mr. Gray, Mr. Uh, you know, I've talked to you a couple of times in this case prior today. I've looked at some of your reports. In, during your deposition, the first time when we took it, uh, you just signed your name and gave your name as F.B. Gray. I thought you were just going by your, your initials. Uh, all your documents are signed F.B. Gray. Today is the first time I ever heard that your name was Franklin Bones Gray. And I want... Burns, sir. Burns, Franklin thank you. Burns. Franklin Burns. I want you to know I'm happy to know that because for all these many months, I thought the F.B. stood for federal bureaucrat. No, no, sir. I, I, I'd like to be frank with you. The, uh... <laughs> Your Honor, I'd, I'd like to leave my initial question about his name and go on to my next one if I could. Please proceed, Your. Please proceed. Uh, Mr. Gray, Will Porter left the bank, the employment of the bank in October of 1994, isn't that correct? That is correct, sir. All right, I'd like, I can't reach Counselor, over there. Counselor, was it 1994? I'm sorry, 1894. <laughs> Excuse me. Transpositional error, we're not without those. 1894, I would, ma'am, would you write the date October 1894 up there on that uh, blackboard for me? Now, after October of 1894, Will Porter wasn't at the bank, was he, to your knowledge? That's correct. And yet, your examination uh, of the bank uh, and yours and Mr. Gannon's examination found discrepancies in that bank and the banking practices well into 19, I'm sorry, into 1895, isn't that correct? That is correct. The troubles at the bank were, were not due to Mr. Porter. Mr. Porter did not create the problems at the bank. Exactly. You just feel he was responsible because he was a teller. Mr. Porter was responsible. As teller of the bank, it's been established that he is responsible for the money that's in the till at his, at his uh, shift. E yes, sir. But that's a, a question of responsibility. That doesn't actually mean Will Porter took any money out of that till, does it? Uh, no, sir, it does not. And isn't it true, Mr. Gray, that the only reason you have pressed so hard for a conviction of my client, Will Porter, is because he was the only bonded employee at the First National Bank? Well, Mr. Carr Lucy of, uh, of the um, uh, American Surety Company did indicate to the, uh, uh, to the Breckenridge brothers that uh, no, no money would be paid on, on the bond unless it could be proven or, or unless indictment could be made against Mr. Porter. And you've urged it so strenuously all these many months, all these years, for that reason. Isn't, isn't that correct, Mr. Gray? It is my job, sir, to, to ferret out and discover irregularities in the banking process. 
And, and what I've found, I will not apologize for. Oh, I'm sure you wouldn't, Mr. Gray. But my question is, is you're here because Will Porter was the only bonded employee at the First National Bank, correct? Uh, I, am, I am here because irreg irregularities have been discovered in the banking practices of this bank, sir. And you and have felt compelled to go against Will Porter because he was bonded. It is... It is the determination of the investigator that Mr. Porter is the responsible party. And he is the only bonded employee or was the only yes, bonded sir, he employee, is. correct? Yes, sir, he is. Now, isn't it true that your boss in Washington, the comptroller of the currency, has taken a public position that because of the financial hard times that the country has been going through, that he wants you and all the other federal bank examiners to clean up the lax banking practices throughout the state of Texas. Objection relevant, Your Honor. Objection sustained. You're on somewhat of a crusade here, aren't you, Mr. Ob Gray? Objection, Your Honor. He's hounding this witness. The, the prosecutor, uh, the court has been tolerant with counsel on both sides. Now, it's important that we get this issue submitted to this jury. Uh, so uh, please be careful in refraining and refrain from making frivolous objections. Please proceed. Kevin. Would you answer the question, sir? Uh, as, as to whether or not I'm on a crusade? Yes, sir. I'm doing my job, sir. Uh, I'm, I'm in the employ of the United States of America. I am, I am under orders of President McKinley to straighten out the, the corrupt banking practices where I am able to locate them. I, I carry no vendetta against anyone personally. And, and I'm doing my job as I see it. And in doing your job, you're doing your job very zealously, aren't you? I like to think that I bring a, a, a measure of, uh, of energy to everything that I do, sir. And I like to think Counsel, that, I, Counsel, that I receive uh, a measure of satisfaction. Not, please refrain. We're not trying this witness. So uh, we need to move on with the issue before this court. Your, thank you, Your Honor. Your argument, Mr. Gray, is essentially well, we found a lot of irregularities in the bank. Mr. Uh, Porter was the teller. If Mr. T Porter wasn't responsible, uh, somebody had to be responsible. Isn't that correct? Well, certainly someone has to be responsible, sir. Uh, it's mathematics. It's purely mathematics. The, the, money, the money needs to balance at the end of the day. It needs to balance at the end of the month and at the end of the year. And, and if it doesn't, someone is responsible. Yes, sir, and those other possibilities might be Tom Brackenridge, his brother Bob Brackenridge, Vice President Frank Hamilton. Is that correct? There is no doubt that there were many irregularities done uh, in, in banking practices in this bank, sir, and I believe it has been shown that, that, uh, that all of these uh, shortages were accounted for and made up for in, in all cases but this. And this instance was a shortage that was attributed to Frank Hamilton. $6,000, he paid $3,000, and then you came looking for Will Porter because he was bonded to try to make up the difference. Isn't that right? Essentially, that is correct, sir. Uh, I, don't think that, I don't think that Mr. Hamilton uh, made up the shortages because he considered himself guilty. I believe what he was being very generous in offering to cover 50% of the loss and, and was asking Mr. Porter to cover his share. Oh, I see. But isn't it true that in a l less than a year, a year after Will Porter had left the employment of the bank, Vice President Hamilton's overdrafts mm -hmm. had jumped from $2,300 to $13,500? Uh, yes, sir. I believe that is correct. And isn't it also true that cashier Bob Brackenridge overdra overdrafts after Will Porter left the bank had risen from $2,000 to $10,300? I believe that is correct. I, I, I have not given this bank a clean bill of health, sir. It, uh, it, is, it is far from the perfect banking institution even yet today. You're right, Mr. Gray, and I pass the witness. I ha only have one question, Your Honor. All right, proceed. Mr. Gray, Mr. Hamilton had nothing to do with the Gwaltney credit slip and the other credit slip from Waco that are the subject of the indictment here today, did he? No, he did not. This, this, was, uh, this has been shown to be uh, purely on Mr. Mr. Porter's watch, Mr. Porter's account. Thank you, Mr. Gray. By the way, Mr. Gray, Mr. Bob Brackenridge was the cashier, an officer directly over the bank teller, Mr. Porter, during this period of time, wasn't he? That is correct.
pass the All right. Uh, uh, Madam Prosecutor, does that conclude your... That concludes our case, Your Honor. Witnesses? All right. Please step down. Mr. Defense Attorney, would you call your first witness? Your, your Honor, before I do that, I would like to move for a directed verdict. Uh, in addition to our not guilty plea, uh, we have also pled the defense of the three years statute of limitations to counts two and three. Well, this, this court's not paying any attention to calendars today, and so I, I'm not going. I'm, I'm going to turn down your motion uh, in that regard. And it's in, we have heard this jury has heard the prosecution's case. Uh, I believe the defen defendant is entitled to be heard, and I would ask you to proceed to put on your defense. Your Honor, for the record, I'd like to urge two more motions for directed verdict, so I might preserve this record that when please, my... Please reduce them to writing and submit them to him. Submit I, them to Your Honor, this, this man was a fugitive uh, for nine uh, months. Uh, He's... Counsel, uh, you, have, uh, you have finished your case. I'm asking the defense attorney to please call his first witness now. I, I'll reduce them to writing, but I consider you'll overrule Would you please call your first witness now? Yes, Your Honor, I'll call David Harrell. Mr. Harrell, please tell us how you're known. I'm known, sir. Hey, what, what's your name? Counsel, oh. ask his name. <laughs> we, want name? To know, <laughs> we want to know this man's name. Uh, my name is David Harrell. Uh, you know Will Porter here? I, I do. In fact, how, I've, how long have you known Will? I've known him since um, he first came to Austin uh, back in, uh, in 84. He uh, had been staying with, um, with Dick Hall in a ranch south, uh, south of San Antonio. Uh, for um, almost two years by that time, and uh, but uh, Dick Hall had uh, given up the ranching business and moved up to Austin, and uh, uh, Will Porter came with him, and he introduced uh, Porter to, to my father, Joe Harrell. They were all from uh, uh, North Carolina originally, and uh, uh, Will was from a respectable family there, and uh, and so we, we took to him right away, uh, and so did my father. There were four of us brothers, uh, and housing was hard to come by then. Austin was, a lot of people were coming to Austin right around that time. In fact, it was a pretty exciting place to be, and uh, it was hard to get room and board. So uh, my father said, well, there, there are four brothers here. Let's uh, let it be five, and um, invited him uh, to stay as really as long as he liked. And uh, he was like a brother to me. We, uh, uh, we liked him quite a bit. We, in fact, he shared a room with me, and um, uh, we sort of grew into our 20s together. Did he, while he, you and he were living in your parents' home, did he seek employment? He did. He um, had uh, worked as a druggist uh, in, uh, in North Carolina, and he uh, sent for and, and, and got a, uh, a recommendation from his previous employers. Do you have that recommendation today with you? I, I did bring a copy of that. Would you um, read it to us? It's uh, from Porter and Dalton, Dealers in Drugs. Uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Quite a respectable uh, firm there in North Carolina here. Um, May 26, 1884. It says, to whom it may concern, we've known the bearer, Mr. W.S. Porter, intimately, both as druggist and citizen. His character was above report, reproach, and as a druggist, uh, we invariably found him careful, painstaking, and accurate. We feel that he will acceptably fill any position he's willing to accept. Now, it's signed by Dr. Cheek, um, Dr. Logan, Dr. Beale, and uh, Dr. Hall, who was the um, uh, ex-president of the Medical Association of North Carolina. So obviously he came well recommended, and uh, he, he did um, uh, get a job at the Morley's Drug Store here in town. After uh, he went to work as a pharmacist at Morley uh, Brothers Drug Store, did he uh, ever work in your dad's cigar store? He did from time to time. Um, he, uh, I got paid a little from that, but uh, of course, uh, my father uh, never, never charged him any rent, and uh, so it was kind of a, uh, he would help out in the drugstore. And what other employment has he had while he's been here in Austin? He did work, go to work at the uh, Maddox uh, Brothers real estate firm. Um, they were friends of ours, and, and there he learned uh, bookkeeping. Uh, and after that, what did he do? Well, then he went to work at the uh, First National Bank. Or not, I mean, then he then he got married, and at that time he, he went to work uh, at the general land office. Um, now, Dick Hall had by that time uh, gone into politics, and uh, 
he'd become the land commissioner of Texas. So. And then when uh, Mr. Hall uh, lost the office of land commissioner, uh, or I think he he uh, ran for governor, uh, he went to work for the First National Bank? That's correct. What did you and Will do in your leisure time when Will was not working? Well, Austin was an exciting uh, place at that, at that time. There's a lot of amateur theatricals, um, uh, a lot of music of various kinds going on. Uh, Will was a particularly talented and, and very likable young man. Uh, he played guitar and uh, he also was a cartoonist. He was always sketching and drawing, making little caricatures. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, impressed us all. He was, uh, um, like I say, a very likable guy and, and, a, uh, and a very witty guy and fun to have around. He was never pushy or boisterous, though. He um, was always um, respectful and, uh, and fairly soft-spoken. Um, so you, you mentioned his marriage. Uh, he married Athel Estes. That's correct. That's uh, Pete, Mary Jane Roach's daughter. That's right. Uh, and uh, after his marriage, tell us what kind of family man you observed Will as being. Well, he was a, a, a very devoted father uh, and uh, always uh, took time to, to play with, uh, with Margaret and, uh, and joke and um, tell stories with her. Uh, he uh, liked to draw cartoons again. He, he would draw uh, Valentines for her. And uh, I, I would say that, that he had quite a nice relationship with his, uh, with his daughter. Now, he didn't have any family money like uh, many of us did, and uh, he had to work quite hard at the bank, uh, you know, to get um, to keep the family going. And also, he was hoping to go on into into writing, so he worked uh, long hours at the uh, newspaper. Yes, sir. Let me ask you about that. The prosecutor in her opening statement made a big deal about Will's needing money. Um, is there something that ever made you think Will would ever do anything dishonest or illegal to get that money? Absolutely not. He was uh, a, certainly a, a trustworthy young man from a good family and uh, um, never gave me any, indica any indication that he would do anything dishonest. And after his marriage, did uh, Mr. and Mrs. Roach support Will in his activities? They did. They always remained uh, strong supporters of, of uh, Do you of know of any instance where Will needed money that he could not go to the Roaches and they would loan him the money he needed? As far as I know, he, they were forthcoming at every request he made. Yes, they didn't, they didn't uh, turn him away. What's your understanding of the reputation for the First National Bank here in Austin? Well, it was, we always thought of it as a rancher's bank. Now, of course, uh, uh, that was a, a period of, they were coming off a period of, of boom times in cattle and the ranchers uh, had a good deal of money and so it was frankly handled quite loosely. Uh, also they were, the ranchers, uh, the people who ran the bank and their customers were all ranchers so they were known to one another and would, um, um, you know, pass money pretty freely uh, amongst themselves. Uh, for instance, a, uh, if somebody needed to pay off his hands, he'd just give them a note and they'd go down to the bank and uh, would be paid, and um, uh, and they'd work it out later. So when you say, pay off his hands. Are you t referring to cow hands? Cow hands, yes, your honor. Yes. And sometimes the money was given to that cowman, that rancher, uh, even without a, a note being signed. Isn't that correct? That's correct. It, it was uh, on an informal basis, so, as among friends. Yes, sir. And by the way, to Major Tom Brackenridge is a rancher today, isn't he? That's correct. Um, Two years ago, Will was arrested. What effect did you observe that had upon him? Well, I must say it was, uh, it was devastating to him. He, he uh, as, I, as I've said, he was a, a man from a, a good family in, in North Carolina and very conscious of his, uh, his good name and his standing in the community. Uh, he, he was, uh, through our family, had been introduced into really, uh, if I may say, some of the finest uh, people in Austin. and. Uh, I believe truly valued his reputation amongst them, not to mention his family name. So to be accused of, of such a thing was, was really uh, difficult for him. And as a friend, would you say that Will Porter is very loyal to his friends? I've certainly found him to be so, yes. Uh, this last year before trial, Will has lived here in Austin? Uh, some of the time he has, yes, yes. He's been out and free to go about the countryside. He's not been in jail, has he? Absolutely, no. I passed the witness. 
Mr. Harrell, I just have a few questions. Are you familiar with the Bismarck Cafe? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> and it, was that a familiar place of recreation for you and Mr. Porter? It was. It was popular amongst our crowd. Uh, and did you throw dice for beer there and drink there? It was the custom there, yes. And play games? Uh, yes, ma'am. And eat caviar sandwiches? When those of us who could afford them or would treat them, yes. And in fact, Mr. Porter borrowed money from you from time to time, did he not? He did borrow from time to time and, of course, repaid it. And from others, is that right? I believe so, yes. And isn't it a fact that Mr. Porter was known for being able to drink a half a gallon from a vessel without having the vessel leave his mouth? I, I've heard that story told. Of course, there was, there was a lot of bragging and tall tales going on amongst that. Uh, well, and, and, you, and you've seen it close to half a gallon, have you not, Mr. Harrell? I would have to say that, yes. And in fact, Mr. Porter often returned home to his poor ailing wife, Ethel, in a highly liquefied condition. Isn't well, that right? I, I must say that uh, though he did uh, drink, he never appeared to be particularly drunk. I, you might say he could hold his liquor quite well, and he was certainly never disrespectful or abusive or, uh, or loud. Um, so You're saying he could drink, isn't that right? He could drink without becoming abusive or and, loud. Or, and or, you know him. You knew him also as a storyteller of the first class. Isn't that right, Mr. Harold? Well, of course, storytelling was popular amongst us all, and, and he was quite good at it. Uh, and he was one of the finest. I, he was. I would say his his fame actually uh, amongst our crowd rested more on his uh, his voice. He was an excellent singer. Uh, and he told stories, did he not, Mr. Harold? As we all told stories. Yeah. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. I want to ask one question. You're talking about his singing. I'm interested in his church activity. Did he sing in the church? He did. In fact, he sang in four different church choirs uh, here in town. He also sang with the Hill City Quartet, which was uh, um, a group of young men who were quite popular around. And, uh, um, and impromptu, uh, there was a lot of music at that point in uh, amateur theatricals. Um, but uh, he, you know, he sang in numerous situations. But the, the church singing was especially important to him, I thought. If I may, Your Honor, uh, and he, there were times, however, when he did not show up for church after the Bismarck Cafe, <laughs> isn't that right, Mr. Harrell? Well, uh, since he was attending several different churches, I really couldn't testify to that since he might have been at another church from the, the <laughs> one. <that> uh, <laughs> Do you have any further questions, Prosecutor? No, no further questions, Your Honor. Any further questions? No, Your Honor. All right, you'll call your next witness. Yes, we would call uh, Mrs. P.G. Roach. Counsel, proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Mrs. Roach, please give us your full name. Martha Jane Roach. And how are you related to Will Porter? I'm his mother-in-law. Now, is your daughter Will's wife still with us? No. Um, Ethel died last uh, summer, just about six months ago. During their marriage, how did you observe Will's devotion to your daughter? Oh, he was wonderful as a, a husband and as a father. It's already been established that the little Margaret was just the apple of his eye, and he did all kinds of wonderful things for her. And since her mother's death, he has just been um, above reproach in every way. He spent time with her, and he's told her stories, and he's comforted her. Has the death of your daughter not only been very traumatic to you and Mr. Roach, but has it been devastating to Will Porter? Yes, it has. In fact, he has told me that if it were not for Margaret, that he did not have any reason to keep living. I know this is very difficult for you, Ms. Roach, but we do appreciate your cooperation in answering the, the question. We'll see, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Your husband, uh, Pete Roach, what does he do for a living? Well, he um, is a grocerman and uh, uh, owns a small uh, ranch out from Austin. Um, describe for us your and your husband's impressions of work. <laughs> well, our first impression was, was kind of funny because um, as a part of the Hill City Quartet, Will came by serenading one night. And my husband went out and chased them away because it was midnight, and he was very uh, disturbed to have his uh, sleep disturbed. And uh, he, uh, Will Porter was kind of the spokesman for that group, and he said, "Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Roach. We will, we will never come back on your 
place again. And just as he left, he looked up in the window and he saw my daughter, Ethel, whom he had met and he'd already fallen in love with her. And the, his friends uh, kidded him about it and said, well, it'll be pretty hard for you to uh, pay court to Miss Estes if, uh, if her stepfather won't even let you come on the place. But anyway, they, they made peace. And my husband w admires him very much. And in fact, you and your husband have been very supportive of Will in all of his activities? Yes, we have. Have you and your husband ever denied Will any monetary support at times that he's needed that? Not any time that my husband had. In fact, he, uh, he went on his bail, uh, $2,000. Um, and uh, uh, more recently, they doubled the bail and he, uh, he doubled his, uh, his bond. Did you or your husband ever question Will's willingness and ability to pay that money back if he needed to? Oh, no. no. Has there ever been anything in your experience that would point to anything other than innocence of Will Porter or the charges that he's accused of here today? Objection, Your Honor. This witness knows Objection nothing about. Objection, This lady is entitled to answer um, that question. I, um... Uh, I have seen Will in a number of uh, situations uh, in which he was, was very quiet in accepting any kind of uh, a criticism um, or um, just not being uh, able to stand up and defend himself. I think there are people like that who just, um, you could accuse them from uh, almost anything, as one of his friends said, uh, of uh, killing his grandmother. And, uh, and some of these people, and I think Will's one of them, just would not, uh, uh, he wouldn't stand up and say, I didn't do it. Would you say that Will avoids confrontation? I certainly would. Is that part of his nature as you've yes. observed it? Yes. Uh, has there been anything that Will has ever said in your presence or hearing, though, that would indicate that he ever took a position that he was anything other than innocent of the charges brought uh, against him today? Your Honor, may I read a letter that Will wrote to me from uh, the county jail? Uh, the court would be pleased to hear it. Um, he said, uh, I feel very deeply the forbearance and long-suffering kindness shown by your note, and thank you much for sending things. I'd sent a uh, writing table and some uh, stationery and other things to him at the jail so he could uh, do this very thing. Right now I want to state solemnly to you that in spite of the jury's verdict, I am absolutely innocent of any wrongdoing in that bank, bank matter. Your Honor, I have to object. This witness can, Here, Mr. Porter the, can the, take the, the stand. Objection is overruled. Please proceed. Uh, except so far as foolishly keeping a position that I could not successfully fill. And, uh, Your Honor, I'd like to uh, insert, insert here that he would uh, sometimes come home for dinner, that's 12 o'clock meal, and rush right back to the bank because he said he didn't know what would happen to his cash box while he was gone. Um, anyway, um, he said, um, I care not so much for the opinion of the general public, but I would have a few of my friends still believe that there's some good in me. I wouldn't tell Margaret anything about the matter except that I'm away, for I may be able to fix matters in a little while. Thanking you again for your kindness. And, um, and I think by fix matters, he meant the appeal that he hoped to, uh, to offer. Yes, thanks, Ms. Uh, Mrs. Roach. In Will left the employment of the bank in October of, uh, in October of 1894? Yes. And he was employed as a writer for the Houston Post? Um, before that, he was uh, working for a short time, I believe, for, um, for himself with, at, at the Rolling Stone. And incidentally, that never did bring in a lot of money, but it never did, never did cost him much. Uh, when he originally bought it, it cost him $250 for the, for the printing press and everything about it. So it was not a, a heavy drain on his finances. I pass the witness, Your Honor. Do you have any further questions? Yes. Mrs. Roach, you love your son-in-law very much, don't you? Oh, yes. He's the son that I never had. And you would hate to see him go to jail, isn't that right? Oh, I certainly would, more for Margaret than for anything else. And he asked you to read that letter so that he wouldn't have to take the stand before this jury. Oh, no, 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 no. He, he wrote me the letter 
uh, after the first trial in uh, uh, just trying to establish with me that he was not guilty. I think it was very and important. And Mrs. To him. Roach, you would do anything you could to help your son-in-law, wouldn't you? Aside from lying. Okay. I have no, nothing further, Your Honor. We have no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Do you have any additional witnesses, counsel? Thank Your you, Mrs. Roach. We appreciate very much. Your Honor, we would call Margaret Porter to the stand. Well, this is very unusual, but uh, I believe under the circumstances, perhaps. Your Honor, the prosecution has to object to this, uh, uh, but uh, I gather I do it for the record only. Your objections will be <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Bailiff, would you show the young lady to the uh, witness stand, please? This is a very unusual, but I think under the circumstances that we are entitled, we're entitled to hear this testimony. Please be seated. We want to hear what you have to say. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Porter, it's customary to start off with telling the court your name. My name is Margaret Porter. And your relationship with Will Porter sitting here is what? He's my papa. Where do you live now? I live in California. And what do you do for a living? I write movie scripts. Now, back in 18... <laughs> I do. Back in 1898, uh, how old were you? I was 10. Now that was at the time of your father's trial? Yes, sir. Uh, what did you know about your father after your mother died? Well, all they would tell me was that, you know, he went away and, and all they would tell me was that he was a traveling salesman. After your adulthood, you came to learn of your father's incarceration. Did you conduct any investigation for your own purposes in looking into your father's case? Yes, I did. I, I wanted very much to clear his name. I, I felt very sad that he never felt like he could tell me about his, his troubles. And so I began um, looking at, at what little newspaper coverage there was that existed and, and trying to talk to people who had been there. Tell us what all you found. Well, um, I found out that the assistant prosecutor in, in the original case, whose name was, was Duval West, never looked at my father as being a criminal. He, he didn't think that my father had, had done anything wrong and had, had told, uh, told someone shortly before he died that he felt like my father had, had been uh, used as an example to try and help clean up the banking industry in Texas. Have you found out anything else in your investigation that, uh, about your father's case? Well, I found out that, that Frank Hamilton, who was the, the vice president of the, the First National Bank, had, had gone to, to Papa and, and asked him to uh, put, put up $1,500 to help clear Mr. Hamilton's portion of, of the debt to the bank. And, um, and, and Papa agreed to do that. Um, he, of course, didn't have the money, and so he went to, to Grandpapa and, and asked him to help him with the money, and he said he would. As a writer yourself, I'm sure you've had occasion to read your many, the many works of your father. In reviewing those, uh, those works, those short stories and other writings, is there anything that you've seen in there that points to your father's innocence? Well, there are so many, many things that, that seem very... Uh, they, they can't be coincidence. The, the names of some of the bankers involved in, in stories such as Friends in San Rosario and A Call Loan and, and Guardian of the Accolade, that it just seems like he was trying to tell someone something. I know that, that he was a very loyal man and, and he told friends of his, and in particular Ann Partland, who is a, a famous writer, um, that there were friends of his who had not been as loyal to him as he would have liked and that he had depended on them to tell the truth at a crucial time and they didn't do that. And in some of his writings, three that come to my mind, Friends in San Rosario, A Call to Loan, The Guardian of the Accolade, were there clues that your father gave us the reader as to really what happened back there in 1894 and 1895? 
Well, he in in the the stories he talks about people who would take loans out or take money out of the bank and fail to leave notes, <laughs> saying that they were the ones who had taken the money. Um, there were bankers whose names were uh, Bob, which was the name of one of the the Brackenridge brothers, and and there were just very many instances sprinkled throughout the stories that just they couldn't be coincidence because they involved people who really existed. After your investigation, to whom does the finger of guilt point? I believe it points to Mr. Hamilton and, and the Brackenridge brothers. I pass the witness, Your Honor. Yeah, I just have a couple of questions. This, this <coughs> witness, so is here for the purpose of explaining historically. This is really not matters that the jury is considering. Uh, would, you, would, your, would your questions add to the historical interpretation? I think it would, Your Honor, and it's directly responsive to right. the last passage. I have two. <laughs> the first, isn't it a fact that in the Friends of San Rosario, that it wasn't the Breckenridge or Hamilton who stole the money in that story, was it? No, it wasn't. Okay. It was someone with a different name. But it wasn't, it wasn't Bank or Bob in that story. And let me also read to you a passage. You know your father's, The Roads We Take. Do you not, Margaret? Yes, I do. And did he write, it was an accident my coming west. I was walking along the road with my clothes in a bundle. I came to a place one evening when the road forked and I didn't know which fork to take. I studied about it for half an hour and then took the left hand. I've often wondered if I wouldn't have turned out different if I'd taken the other road. Now that's a clue as well, isn't it, Margaret? That if he'd made that other decision, if he'd made the decision to go down the right road, we wouldn't be here today. <laughs> Your Honor, I object argumentative. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Counselor. She's thank so you, counsel. mean. Thank you, Counselor. We, we appreciate very much your testimony here today, Ms. Margaret. And now then, does this conclude your... The defense rests, Your Honor. And the, the prosecutor rests? Yes, Your Honor. Now, in the interest of time, we're, we're going to, I want the audience to understand how we're going to proceed. We're going to have brief, close, brief closing statements <laughs> by, by both parties. At that, at that time, I will submit the charge to the jury. And when I submit the charge to the jury, then we're going to excuse the audience for refreshments outside while the jury deliberates in the box. And we'll take about a 10, 15 minute, 10 or 15 minute, 10 minute break. Well, let's take a 10 minute break. We're running a little over time here. And then come back in and we will hear the jury's verdict and the sentencing if necessary. So, uh, Madam Prosecutor, will you proceed with your closing statement? I will, Your Honor, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the evidence. You have heard the bank examiner testify that this defendant is guilty as charged. I think that there are a couple of aspects of this that you need to take into account. The fact that this defendant did not even take the stand to protest his innocence, to tell you that he was innocent. And then second... Your, Honor, I object. Yeah, your, your, your objection overruled. And then... <laughs> Second, it is clear that when he fled to Honduras, he did not want to face you today and that he only came back because of his ailing wife. And then finally, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I want you to take into account that this is a, wit this is a defendant who needs some time to think. This is a defendant who has had a totally undisciplined, dissolute life. We need to give him some time in jail to, to, to dream, to write, to do whatever he will do. Who knows what he may produce in jail? <laughs> so for all of these reasons, the government asks you to find this defendant guilty as charged. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now hear the closing argument from the defense. May it please the court. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, the, issue before you, the issues before you today are three. You're going to be asked to find beyond a reasonable doubt that on the 12th day of November, 1895, William Sidney Porter embezzled from the First National Bank the sum of $299.60 in lawful tender of the United States. <laughs> You're going to be asked, do you find by a reasonable doubt, beyond a reasonable doubt, that on November 12, 
1894, the same thing, that Will Porter embezzled the sum of $299.60 of monies and funds of the First National Bank. Both of those, you'll recall, occurred after Will Porter was no longer at the First National Bank. Third, you'll be asked, do you find beyond a reasonable doubt that on the 10th day of October, 1894, William Sidney Porter embezzled from the First National Bank the sum of $558.48 of the monies and funds from said bank. Now, close, I don't know whether it was October 1st or October 31st that Will left the bank, but in finding for embezzlement, you've got to find that he converted those funds or converted any funds to his own use, and there's no evidence. And for that reason, you must answer in the court's charge not guilty to each of the counts that have been brought against Will Porter today. Now, you may have noticed that Will sat through most of the trial somewhat distracted with his hands behind his back, uh, behind his head. And I submit to you, if you think about it, if you put yourselves in Will's position, his actions, his activities are consistent with an entirely different version, a different theory than what the prosecutor has brought to you today. In fact, it is not unreasonable that if Will Porter had been accused of doing something that his friends actually did, his friends who are powerful, influential people in this community, he would felt that he'd have no chance before a jury such as you. And he might decide that he not needed to leave and not show up for his first trial. But remember, the evidence is also that for the last year, he has come back. And he spent a year here, free to come and go, and yet he has not fled. Now, his despondency, I think we can all feel. We can all see that when six months ago, he lost his wife of some 10 years, 11 years, that it would cause any person to act and behave as Will Porter did. We therefore ask you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, to give Will Porter back his life. Find not guilty to each of the counts that you will be charged by the court on. Thank you. Thank you, Counsel Bailiff. If you will hand the court's charge, I, in the interest of time, I'm not going to read it, would you hand it to Mr. Kusurik, the foreman of the jury? <laughs> and then would you please recess the court? All right. Spectators are invited to go outside into the lobby for refreshments. The jury to remain seated. I do not think that the prosecution proved her point at all. And therefore, I would move that we find William Sidney Porter not guilty. You have heard the motion, the motion being that it was felt that the prosecution had not proved the points of guilt at all. And therefore, for we should find the defendant not guilty. And of course, would there be a second to yes, that? Yes, I've got a second. Now, discussion on that motion. My, my discussion on that point is that in part of this definition, the person must unlawfully and wrongfully convert the same to his own use. There's been no evidence that he converted any of the money to his own use. Even if the money was gone, there was, n and it was his responsibility, there was no evidence that he converted it to his own use. Yeah, but what bothers me, what bothers me more than anything about this whole thing is these caviar sandwiches. Now, what kind of working man is eating a caviar sandwich? I can't buy it. That's a bad drinking. Well, his 10-year-old daughter, his 10-year-old daughter, his 10-year-old daughter's at home, he's out there drinking and eating caviar sandwiches. Yeah, you can only assume that he might have had some money there in the till when it was open or at some other time. But there were too many people that had access. That's yeah. true. Too many people had access to it. Well, we had that back in Seymour's testimony. He looked at all those records, and I think we, we got all that from the bank. I think we need to have a few more questions asked by the prosecution. That bank examiner had his opinion, we're entitled to this to his opinion. Now, should you have some need to refresh your memory as to what was asked, 
then let me pass this around so that you can refresh your memory as to what was asked. And I'll keep my one to my, remind myself that I need to, uh, to uh, judge with you what we have delib deliberated upon. <laughs> you heard the comment here. His friend said that he bought the caviar sandwiches for Well, there was a little bit of that, that sometimes it was bought by everybody and sometimes somebody treated it. That caviar sandwich really bothers me. Well, I think Hamilton I think treated it. He's the one that makes finger in the tail. Could you stand to one side of the other? Yeah. The vice president. The uh, foreman of the jury would be of the opinion that the motion was upon all of the three points of guilt. They are related to funds of embezzlement in each case. So we're discussing all three of the points at the present time. Is there further discussion? Well, except two, because here after that day, positively two were in November. Yeah. What, what she when, is? Uh, the one in three, he was happened in November, the investment, when he no longer worked at the bank. What she is saying is that he was not guilty under any condition for any of the funds on any of the dates. Yes, there's a question here. I want to add my, my thought to that. It certainly seems so the prosecution at no time even attempted to show conversion. Since that is in the judge's charge, we have to find not guilty. <laughs> You're finding that if you didn't hear, in spite of having had caviar, that we must find in that case because there wasn't any proof of conversion that there be a non guilty charge. Yes. I also uh, agree that um, there was just too many other hands in the pot, that certainly there's a reasonable doubt as to whether or not uh, Mr. Porter himself uh, was in fact the one who uh, caused the funds to produce it. It could have been so many other people who had just as much access to it as he had. As foreman of the jury, I note that the uh, crowd's beginning to come back in. So we have now reached a verdict. Is there any difference in the fact that we have reached a verdict, that we will be ready to report to the judge with our verdict? Court be in order. Mr. Foreman of the jury, has the jury reached a verdict? Your Honor, the jury has reached a verdict. Would you please pass it in to the bailiff? As judge of this court, I'm going to read the verdict of the jury. I'm sworn to uphold the law, and the law is that the jury makes a decision on the matters of guilt or innocence. In response to the first issue submitted to the jury, do you find beyond a reasonable doubt that on the 12th day of November, 1895, William Sidney Porter embezzled from the First National Bank the sum of $299.60 in lawful tender of the United States, not guilty? And the same a, uh, answer to each of the other two issues. Now, this court has, has no jurisdiction to change history. So we cannot enter what we in law call a nunk pro tunk judgment of now for then. If we had that jurisdiction, Mr. Porter, we would be pleased to exercise it. Well, our court has done in a couple of hours what it took three days to do in 1898. As you saw, Will sat through that trial, or as you heard, Will sat through that trial 100 years ago without saying a thing, just like he did this afternoon. But since we've already established that we don't mind engaging in a little bit of literary license here in this production today, we're going to end this trial with an O. Henry-like twist and let you hear from Mr. Will Porter. Will? Howdy. It's very fitting that you've asked me to speak up here at the end. <laughs> I don't see the need to say much. I'm a writer, not a speaker. That judge needs an editor, though, doesn't he? 
<laughs> His sentences are too long. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to believe. All them opinions, all that conjecturing, words upon years, words for a hundred years, and it still comes down to that one single little word innocent. <laughs> How many of you know me through my stories? That's mighty good to see. You know, all my stories come from actual events that I've experienced on my travels. All my characters are facsimiles of actual people that I have known. <laughs> many writers spend hours, I'm told, Sometimes days laboring over the outlines of stories they have in their minds. Not I. <laughs> my way of thinking, that's just a waste of good time. I just sit down and let my pencil do the work. People ask me how I get that strange little twist at the end of my stories. I always tell them, in real life, the unexpected is the ordinary <laughs> rather than the unusual. As a newspaper man, I can attest to that fact. On the Houston Post, my obituary notices called forth some of my best poetry. <laughs> For example, his jokes never had a sting. <clears throat> they played like summer lightning around the horizon of life, spreading bright if transitory pictures upon the sky but they were as harmless as the smile of a child. He knew human nature as a scholar knows his book, and the knowledge did not embitter him. He saw all the goodness in frailty, and his clear eyes penetrated the frailty of goodness. <laughs> I hope you all keep on reading my stories long, after I'm gone. I'd like to repeat a quote that Madam Prosecutor read and add a little commentary to it. It's all about roads taken and not taken. I remember it was an accident my coming west. I was walking along with my clothes in a bundle. And I came to a place one evening where the road forked and I didn't know which fork to take. I studied about it for half an hour, and then I took the left-handed. <laughs> I've always wondered if I wouldn't have turned out different if I'd have taken the other road. I go to seek on many roads what is to be. True heart and strong, with love to light, will they not bear me in the fight to order, shun or wield or mold my destiny? You know what I think? It's not the roads we take. It's what's inside of us that makes us turn out the way we do. Well, I hope this little historical play has, has set you in the way of thinking about your own lives. I took my road down to destiny. But you, standing here at the crossroads of life, which road will you take? Thank you.